Welcome back to another episode of the My Radar Podcast. I am meteorologist Mike Linden coming at you from our studio here in Orlando, Florida. And just as a reminder, if you aren't already to the YouTube channel, subscribe and click on that notification bell. That way you always know whenever we drop a new video. My guest on today's episode of the podcast is a fellow Ohio University Bobcat. Uh, him and I, uh, we went to college together. He was a few years younger than me, uh, but we still had some crossover working at WOUB, the PBS station in Athens, Ohio. My guest today is Andrew DePaulo of WFMJ in Youngstown, Ohio. Andrew, how are you? Oh, good, man. Good times back then, huh? How are you? I, I'm doing well. I mean, I still have incredibly uh, fond memories of, of OU, uh, so, uh, you know, some extracurricular memories for sure. <laughs> um, uh, you, if you know, you know. Uh, but yeah. o- otherwise, I, I just I always think back at even just little, little things I picked up in college when it came to not only my meteorological knowledge working in such a unique part of the country, uh, but mm-hmm. but just in, in basic, I felt as though basic TV philosophy to apply to what we do on a daily basis. Yeah, you know, that's one of the most unique things about um, WUB and um, not only the journalism program, but the meteorology program. And they set you up. Um, They set you up for the real life, uh, the real life knowledge and kind of examples that you'll need when you go out into the professional world. I mean, they let you know what they're looking for, what what news directors are looking for when you apply for that first job. Um, not many places have that, that sort of studio that we have and the equipment that we used. And, uh, you know, it was, it's something that just is, is one of a kind. Um, and it's just really kind of priceless knowledge that you learn there. And, uh, you know, you'll, you'll never kind of regret that. No, not not in the slightest bit. And and you, of course, you're still forecasting in the state of Ohio. And uh, yeah. f- for those watching or, or listening, the state of Ohio, boy, is it a wacky weather state. I mean, you want to talk about four <laughs> super duper distinct seasons and, and especially where you are. I mean, the winter is almost kind of turbocharged, right? Yeah, we've got a little bit of everything. Um, you know, we've got the lake effect snow um, and that always throws a wrench in a lot of things during the winter. You know, something that's kind of an, an underestimated aspect about our forecasting is cloud cover forecasting. Um, you know, we've got the lake. You've really got to watch the wind direction. You've really got to watch the clouds. This area, it, it might not be so cloudy up in Cleveland. Those clouds, that moisture drags over our area and all of a sudden, poof, a mostly sunny Saturday could turn into a mostly cloudy Saturday, you know, in, in a forecast cycle. So it is tough. Yeah, uh, a yeah. lot of people ask me all the time. You know, do you plan on heading out into a different area? Listen, this area right here is one of the hardest to forecast in the state. It doesn't matter about market size. You're getting, if you can forecast here, you can forecast a lot of other places. It is tough. Yeah, so I I would have to guess that especially during the winter when it comes to lake effect snow, uh, that you probably have a lot of of folks there. I I would imagine there's no in-between, I guess what I'm trying to say. People either love the snow or they absolutely hate it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you get the people that, you know, once it snows, they start complaining and you're like, listen, you know, <laughs> how long have you lived here? You, come on. You, you got to expect this. Uh, but yeah, you get a lot of people that uh, depend on it for part of their job. A lot of uh, snowplow drivers, believe it or not, in this area, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, truck drivers in this area uh, that really depend on an accurate forecast and need to know about those road conditions uh, and whatnot. But uh yeah, you know, you got a good mix, like you said, of people that love it and then the people just first snake, first uh, flake falls out. They're out. They hate it. <laughs> yeah, I, I always used to joke uh, that you can't shovel the rain, right? Yeah. So it's, <laughs> you, yeah. you know, that's just how it goes. So yeah. how did you how did you fall in love with weather? I feel like you ask any meteorologist that question, like what was the one meteorological event that just hooked you? What was yeah. it for you? You know. About it was around the second grade. We were learning about clouds in the second grade, and I fell in love with with weather. And I was just, you know, determined to be a meteorologist from there. Um, you know, one specific event that really kind of got me turbocharged was probably not. Into, I mean, I loved weather up until this point, but what really kind of got me super interested in kind of the harder aspects of meteorology was the derecho event when. Um, 
oh gosh, what was that, 2012? Uh, I was living in Columbus, and it affected a lot of people in Ohio, but it affected central Ohio and southeastern Ohio. And I remember there were winds that went down the street I was living on in Columbus, just off Ohio State campus, and picked up these trees like they were like little weeds in the ground and just woof. And I had no idea, no knowledge really uh, of a derecho, of a windstorm of that magnitude and what it could do. I mean, we didn't have power for like two weeks. So a lot of it was the specific weather event. And a lot of it was more of the kind of the implications afterwards. Um, and that's something I really kind of enjoy about weather too it's you know it's but it's also the lifestyle implications you know how are people how are people going to be affected um how is severe weather going to to impact um you know power outages and, and that type of thing how are people going to clean up um it, it's all those things kind of curled up in a ball uh that really kind of get me excited about weather yeah i mean f for me at least it, it started with a hurricane so on, on a much yeah. much much larger scale but, but yeah, either sure. way i mean it could be as simple as just your regular old rain event a hurricane a tornado or even just a couple of flakes of snow um i know yeah. me living here in florida now probably not going to see much of that anymore <laughs> uh but at least i'll be able to uh watch all the the meteorologists i know across the country have to deal with it but i still love <laughs> forecasting the snow so for those that, that I guess aren't aware of maybe the current state of television news, I mean, meteorologists now are being asked to even be more of a jack of all trades, not only being able to get in front of the green screen or the weather wall and work without a script, something that, I don't know, do you feel as though people really know that? I feel as though that's still kind of like a little secret that maybe people yeah. aren't fully aware of. You're not wrong. Um, it surprises me every time somebody asks me. I get it from time to time. A lot of people kind of maybe don't even ask because they just assume that we we do use a script. But when I do say when we get tours in here and I say, hey, there's there's no there's a script in the teleprompter. We do not use that. It is all ad libbed. A lot of people, you know, the kids and then especially maybe the parents coming on with the tour, they get wide eyed. I mean, they're very they're very intrigued that, oh, these guys ad lib for three minutes. Right, and and as we were discussing earlier, being able to have that skill, thinking on your feet for something so scientific like the weather, to then have to go out into the field and report. I mean, when when I was working in, uh, in my first job, I would do the morning show, which was uh, like almost four hours, then I would do cut-ins, and then from there, grab a camera and get out the door and shoot something for the evening news. But that's not unusual anymore i mean no. are, are you doing reporting yeah so i do a monday through friday now so i was i'm blessed to be off weekends and to be monday through friday and have pretty much a nine to five monday through friday that is unheard of pretty much in tv news so i'm very blessed to have that schedule monday through wednesday i come in i forecast i do the midday so i'm just getting off the midday show our midday is an hour long that's one of the things i love about it too 12 to 1 and once i'm done I usually do some kind of reporting afterwards. It might be a small Vosot, um, a smaller story for people that don't know that uh, terminology for the 6 p.m. or 11 p.m. news. Sometimes I'm doing a package or a longer story for our weekend newscasts, um, something a little more featurey. So um, I, I get to go out in the community and I get to talk to people. And a lot of the reporting isn't hardcore reporting. It isn't Paul. It isn't political. Um, I've done it. I've done it all political. I've done the hard interviews. I've done the investigative stuff. This is more so getting to go out in the community, meet the people, tell their story. And it allows me to take a step back and really enjoy the story more and work on my storytelling because that's what, you know, that's what reporting is, is, is storytelling. I always felt like uh, some of the reporters maybe harbored a little little resentment, N not any kind of hate and anything yeah. intense like that. But whenever you're at the editorial meeting and usually the weather person gets the, you know, like you said, the more featurey story, the quote unquote good news stories. And uh, I know that those are the stories that the reporters, they, they want to go out and talk about the dog fashion show or the, you know, the service animal or something like that. A lot, couple animal stories there for you. But either, <laughs> either way, what, the good stuff that's going on in communities that people just seem to latch on to and love but i don't know i feel as though doing that stuff covering those events just makes you a better forecaster a better presenter unless you said a storyteller because that is at the end of the day the weather is a story yeah no absolutely and not only are you getting out you're getting out of the the office which i i preach about 
I don't like being stuck in a building for eight hours a day. I'm getting out in the community. Even if I'm doing something really small, I'm getting out and I'm meeting someone new. I'm meeting somebody in the community new. I'm making a new resource, you know, a new connection. On Thursdays and Fridays, I'm also doing what's called our out and about segments. So we go to businesses. They're more featurey. We go to businesses, you know, new shops around around the area, and you know, I'm featuring these for the morning show. Um, and it's all ad lib, and nothing's nothing scripted. And it helps me. That helps me for my weather. Um, and I decided to do it because I was doing already so much ad libbing in general from weather. I said I, I think I can give this a try. And it just helps me that much more because I'm thinking on my feet about questions. I have to converse with these people. Um, nothing's planned. I don't script any questions out. We kind of talk a couple minutes beforehand. But me having that conversation with someone translates to the green screen because I'm having that conversation now just about the weather with the people at home. Mm -hmm. Now, l let's talk about what this year has been like. Uh, in your neck of the woods, the 2018, yeah. 2019 kind of weather year. And, and we, I just had this conversation with a person yesterday about the polar vortex, the, the dreaded polar, polar vortex. This was an incredible winter, at least when I was still forecasting in the northeast. Uh, for, for you, located a bit more centrally, talk about, I mean, how intensely cold and uh, how much snow you guys dealt with this year. Yeah, I mean, we, we dealt with, with a good deal. Actually, you know, I think it was a little bit less than last year, snowfall wise. Um, it was pretty much on point as far as kind of like what, what we should be, what we should be getting. We kind of had a couple hard thumps of snow. Mm -hmm. And then after that, it was kind of a little accumulation here, a little accumulation here and it added up uh, more nuisance snow at times. And we had one big one that added up 10 to 12 inches plus in some areas. That was, that was a big one. Um, but the cold, the cold was was the main story. Um, never have I ever been outside reporting in the cold that I had to deal with this this year. It was I remember I was doing a midday live weather outside of our station here in Youngstown, 35 below zero Oof. with the wind. Oof. And it takes a toll on you. And I didn't realize how much of a toll. I mean, I came back after the morning show because I did the morning show, too. I mean, it felt like I had just been working out for four hours my muscles ached my eyes were burning a little bit kind of had a headache i've never experienced that before yeah that's uh that's definitely pipe freezing weather for sure yeah. for yeah. sure and now it, do you feel as though the winters in, in your neck of the woods have been a bit more intense lately or like you said is it kind of just run of the mill as far as the snow i mean the cold really again that really sticks yeah. out to me how brutally cold it has been yeah. uh, in spots these past couple of years yeah you know we get a lot of emails oh well, what happened to the snow we used to see you know back when we were kids and we've actually seen more snow in this area than we have been you know in the 60s 70s or, or 80s so we've progressively seen a little bit more snow uh, every single year um and i think last year i think last year we had more snow than this year just by just by a little bit i think the year before that we were more in an el nino so we were kind of a little calmer mm. uh, as far as snowfall goes but um you know we we definitely still we still we still have it uh, i haven't really noticed a lack of snow um it's been there it might not be enough to plow um at times i know a lot of uh we get a lot of feedback from the plow drivers as far as oh it's been a quiet winter it really hasn't it just hasn't added up that much mm -hmm. you know might add up like i said nuisance snow uh, an inch here three inches here not a whole lot that you need to plow or worry about the snow blowers but uh you know, the cold and the snow have pretty much been on par over the past couple of years. Every time I did a plow or every time I talked to a plow driver, they all kind of said a very similar or all, always felt similarly that snow is one thing. They can deal with that. But it's the ice that is just the oh, yeah. total, total, total game changer. Mm -hmm. And I, I feel like we had a couple rounds of ice this year. It hasn't been too, too bad. It wasn't too, too bad this past winter. Um, but yeah, you know what? Well, I remember when I was in OU. Ice was a big problem, mm. um, especially with all those hills and walking to class. I mean, it it was an issue walking on the sidewalks and everything. And, um, you know, thankfully this year we didn't have to deal with, with too much. But it, I remember about two years ago, we've got um, we got a highway connector here 
um, and it's basically just all one bridge. Mm. And there was a little bit, of, a little bit of freezing mist, which is very hard to detect. I mean, you got to do some hardcore skew T looking and all that to really kind of take in what's falling and the temperatures. Sure, the and viewers all that. at home love hearing about skew T's. Oh. Got to oh, imagine yeah. <laughs> they love when we bring that up. Yeah, um, but there was a thirty car pilot. On, it was essentially a bridge, Oof. so everything, of course, freezes faster on the bridge. But that freezing mist, so hard to detect, mm. just kind of like another aspect of winter weather that's like, you got to look at everything here. You cannot let your guard down at all. you got to check all the boxes because you can get anything. So let, let's change gears here. Let's talk about uh, the severe weather season, the season that we're okay. kind of in right now. Now, when I was, again, still up in the Northeast forecasting, we had – this was in the state of Pennsylvania. This previous October, um, it was just an insane day as far as tornadoes are concerned. Just a record number of tornadoes on that particular day. I want to say it was around 14 across the entire state, which equaled the number of tornadoes for that month since 1955. Totally, yeah. totally bananas. But I know that you are kind of on the western edge of that, at least west of Pittsburgh, right there into northeastern Ohio. Mm -hmm. What has it been lately for you uh, as far as severe thunderstorms and tornado forecasting going? Yeah, you know, I'm drawing a blank as far as when those tornadoes happened, but we had some in Trumbull County, which is the count. It's Ashtabula County butts up against Lake Erie, and then Trumbull County is the one uh, just south of that. Uh, it was either in December or January uh, where we had a couple EF zeros, EF zero tornado, very rare. I think it was January. Mm. Uh, I think it was the first time since 1954. Oof. Uh, remembering that we've seen that many tornadoes uh in january but we just we just had uh the the shelby tornado and we were in here covering it uh watching it track because that same line produced a tornado warning for trumbull county but did not produce any ef0 tornadoes in our area mm. um last year and the year before that we dealt a lot with microbursts so we had a lot of damage from microbursts. There was a, there was an Ashtabula County. There was a macroburst. Um, so very hard to detect here because where we are in Youngstown, you've got Cleveland, you've got Pittsburgh. Those radar beams are real high in the sky by the time they come over Youngstown. And that low level rotation is really hard to pick up when we deal with microbursts. So haven't dealt with that this year, but we did have to already deal with our first kind of round of severe weather, which was it was nice to get our feet wet uh, as far as severe weather coverage goes. Now. I would have to imagine that you have dealt with this at some point in your career, breaking in to talk about severe weather, and then you get mm -hmm. those emails, the Facebook comments, the tweets, mm -hmm. all saying like, how dare you break into MasterChef Junior? I was trying to watch that. <laughs> it's, I mean, you, you're, I would imagine you're laughing because it's true. I mean, I dealt with it that is. all the time. And oh, yeah. let's be real here. It's to talk about weather information that could potentially be life-saving. I mean... Have you dealt with that kind of uh, – have you had viewers reach out to you in a severe situation like that? I mean I'm talking severe thunderstorm warning, tornado warnings. We had – I had viewers, and this was like two years ago, severe uh, severe thunderstorm warning. We had the crawl on and the bug. NBC had NHL playoffs on. The Pittsburgh Penguins were on. So big Pittsburgh Penguin fan base here in Youngstown, Northeast Ohio and Western PA. Yeah. And I just start ripped to shreds. Uh, um, that was fun. Um, I dealt with a tornado warning a year, about a year and a half ago or so. And I didn't get too many. But did you see the Mike Wilbon tweet speaking of that? I was, that was going to be my next question. I uh, Yeah. Uh, now, now for those of you that haven't seen this, Michael Wilbon, a, uh, I believe he works for the – I know he does – pardon the interruption yeah, on yeah. ESPN. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if he still works in print journalism. I'm unsure. But yeah, I'm either, way, either way, he essentially yeah. put out a tweet talking about how uh, – like how dare you break in? Like why don't you let Tiger, Tiger Woods finish out his putting? And bear mm -hmm. in mind, the Masters had ended – Hours ago, this was a replay, and though yeah. that same winter, that same weather event, I believe, killed eight people, including yeah. several children. So, talk about a super tone deaf uh, tweet. Um, I saw that I was blown away. Figured that someone like like him would probably know that that's probably a no no to do. Well, it's kind of mind blowing that ESPN didn't 
I don't know, kind of nudge him to make any sort of an apology, either on air. And I might be wrong. I don't watch the show. I don't have ESPN. So he might have done an on air apology. But on Twitter, there was no sign mm. of any recollection there, a uh, reconciliation rather there. Uh, it was just mind blowing to me. I mean, you got to be more. You've got to be more aware of what's going on, especially someone in the spotlight like, like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it, it's just, you know, it, if it's for a reason, come on, man, you you got to be more aware and more present and and kind of have a better heads up of, of what you're tweeting out um, before you actually tweet it out. So, so on that, uh, to kind of piggyback off of that, um, and and I caught some of this flack uh, in markets where, where I've where I've worked that some people feel as though you, you're pestering them with the that kind of information to break in. Do you feel as though the people in your market take uh, these severe events seriously? I mean, I'm trying to I'm struggling for a word to 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 say, but. You, yeah. you know what I'm saying, right? That, you know, yeah. these are these are life threatening events in some situations, whether it's, as you said, those microbursts and macrobursts or, again, a tornado outbreak. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize, you know, just because we have EF zeros, EF ones here, you know, those can still do a ton of damage. You know, a tree falls on a roof. I mean, or a house collapses. I mean, people need to know this information just because it's not an EF five doesn't do damage doesn't mean in some way so for the most part a lot of people are really thankful and grateful that we come on the air and we provide them with the information that we did um three weeks ago we were live on the air two weeks ago whenever that shelby tornado was we were live on the air we had a whole plan together a whole communication plan about 12 hours before it actually happened i was in here with our chief he was in the studio i was in the weather center we would just go back and forth and we had two reporters out in the field it's not necessarily even it is about the rotation or the tornado warning or whatever and the winds and how fast the winds are mm. but then you get the flash flooding on top of that as well right uh you know and flash flooding and lightning or flooding and lightning you know top two killers weather event wise um so it's it's just such a multi facet approach to doing severe weather and i find that mostly people in this area are grateful and appreciative of us because we do show the respect for weather with us at WFMJ, um, and people really kind of digest that well and really appreciate that. Well, I don't want to keep you for too long, Andrew. I know that you uh, that you have to work on uh, your uh, your package for the the, el- yeah. the evening shows. Thank you so much for for coming on and talking to me. Is there anything else that you want to mention before we say goodbye? You know, not really. Just follow me on social media. I'm posting, you know, uh, post a lot of pictures on Instagram. And, uh, you know, our world, our, our weather world is is slowly going to the digital side of things, um, whether it be podcasts like you, yours uh, or, you know, social media networks, YouTube. This is how people are getting their, their weather information. And I think it's a great thing. Um, you know, we're adapting to it. And, uh it's just kind of like a whole new frontier of meteorology and how people get their information. So, um, yeah, I mean, great job, uh, you know, on your end with this podcast, man. Great to see you and, uh, you know, good luck to you in the future. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate that. Absolutely. And of course, I forgot to mention at the top of the podcast, I got to get better at doing this. It is also available on SoundCloud as well. All you okay. have to do is search for the My Radar podcast, and that is where you can find it. So again, if you are not subscribed to the YouTube channel, go to youtube.com slash My Radar, I believe it is. Click on that subscribe button. And of course, remember to click on the notification bell as well. Until the next one, we'll see you later. Yeah.